never risen before 11 a.m., the shock of rising at 4 a.m. in deepest Scandinavian winter, attending to his toilet with French fastidiousness during the hour of the wolf, followed by a fast, bumpy sleigh-ride over the iron-iced streets through the piercing Arctic blast, there's no point in even trying to imagine how he felt. Within two weeks he caught a chill, which soon turned into pneumonia. A week later he became delirious, and on February the 11th, 1650, he died. One of the great minds of Europe had been sacrificed to the whim of royalty. As a Catholic, in Protestant Sweden, this deeply religious man could not be buried in sacred ground, but had to be interred in the cemetery for unbaptized children. Thirteen years later, the Catholic Church honoured Descartes' memory by placing all his works on its Index of Banned Books, a tradition that continues to this day, when Plato's Symposium was recently put on the Index in Ireland. Later in the seventeenth century, Descartes' body was transferred to Paris, where it was reinterred. During the Revolution, a proposal was put forward that he should be exhumed again and placed in the Pantheon, alongside other great French thinkers. This was put to the National Assembly. In an unusual move, the members divided along scientific lines. Those who favoured the mechanistic Cartesian view of the universe were opposed by members who supported the new Newtonian theory of gravity. Descartes had proposed the theory of vortices to explain how the universe worked. His theory maintained that the movement of one particle affected the movement of all other particles throughout the universe. This took place through a series of interlocking vortices, which encompassed everything from the solar system and the stars down to the smallest particles. This would, of course, have resulted in a system of fiendish complexity, such as only a mathematician could conceive. Yet it points to a matter of some interest in the evolution of human thought. Descartes' theory bears a passing resemblance both to the double helix of DNA and the superstring theory of ultimate particles. Also, in his long search for a force that could interact between mind and body, Descartes was looking for something similar to radio waves or electricity. According to the modern thinker Jean de Mondeville, this points to the possibility that human understanding evolves along certain conceptual lines almost regardless of its object. In the vote in the French National Assembly, the Newtonians managed to muster sufficient support to defeat the Cartesians. Gravity had won the day, and Descartes would have to be buried elsewhere. Formerly the truth had been the province of theology. Now it had entered the realm of democracy. Descartes didn't fit into either. Appropriately, he is now buried in the church of Saint-Germain-de-Prés, in the heart of the Latin Quarter in Paris, where his tradition of doubtful thinking and noon rising is staunchly maintained to this day. Afterward Descartes brought philosophy back to life. His revolutionary new way of thinking about the world and our status in it gradually transformed European thought. Things would never be the same again. He instigated a widespread rejection of the moribund Aristotelianism that had gained such a stranglehold on the European mind. From this time on, Aristotelianism was no longer taken seriously by the leading philosophers of the day, though its deathly influence lingered on in universities and seminaries for years to come. This residue was not entirely to philosophy's detriment. The next generation of philosophers, including Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, all had to endure an Aristotelian education. This stupefying experience inspired each of them. Philosophy just couldn't go on like this, and instead they decided to think for themselves. Each, in turn, began looking for an alternative method of thought, and each, in turn, discovered Descartes. Being genuine philosophers, they soon found objections to this new philosophy— no great philosopher worthy of the calling ever accepts the thought of his predecessors without question. For him there can be only one incontrovertible way of thinking, his own. As a result, these new philosophers each set about constructing their own incontrovertible explanation of the world and its problems. Yet all these thinkers, whether they reject or develop Descartes' ideas, stand in his debt. With Descartes, the primacy of the individual and the analysis of human consciousness became fundamental to philosophy. Emphasis was also placed on reason rather than dogma. 
From now on, problems could be approached from a reasonable point of view. Solutions that didn't square with teachings founded on the experiences of a resourceful Bronze Age tribe, or the ideas of a Balkan wise man who had died almost two thousand years earlier, were not necessarily dismissed out of hand. As with all such revolutionary figures, Descartes attracted his inevitable band of followers. They developed his ideas into the philosophy that became known as Cartesianism, and it was now that the shortcomings of Descartes' philosophy became exposed. Descartes insisted on the rational approach. The problems of philosophy could be solved by analyzing them with the use of reason alone. His famous all-embracing process of doubt left this as the only certain evidence. Doubting the evidence of the senses led him to deny experience as a source of certain knowledge. Here, for once, Aristotle remained right. Science could only be based on experience. In Descartes' view, the universe was entirely mechanistic. The physical and biological aspects of the world all worked like a machine, and its innermost mechanics could thus, in theory at least, all be calculated. Belief in this approach remains to this day. Not only is the assessment of subnuclear particles largely a matter of calculation, but we believe that the answers must be susceptible to calculation. Descartes' negation of experience as a certain source of knowledge was soon to prove an embarrassment. Europe was now entering a great age of scientific discovery, which was to reach a peak in Newton's conception of universal gravity. The advances made during this period, from Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood to Halley's discovery of his comet, depended almost exclusively upon observation. At the same time, philosophy too rejected Descartes. The British thinkers Locke, Berkeley, and Hume turned to empiricism. The belief in the primacy of experience as the source of our knowledge. Yet Cartesianism was not entirely exploded. The Cartesians included some colourful figures, and a number became champions of the scientific revolution. The Parisian Regis conducted sensational demonstrations of the new Cartesian physics at his public lectures, which became so popular that they were closed down by Louis the Fourteenth as a danger to public order. Descartes' best-known follower was the French priest Malebranche, who became so convinced of Descartes' mechanistic ideas that he believed in kicking dogs to demonstrate that they were nothing but machines with utterly predictable responses. Boot, bark. Malebranche acknowledged that Descartes had failed to explain the interaction of mind and body, but he put forward the theory of occasionalism to overcome this gap. According to Malebranche. The mind and the body occupy two entirely separate worlds, which never interact and are incapable of affecting each other. But what happens when the mind wills the foot to move, and it then kicks the dog? On every occasion, when the mind wills something in its separate mental world, Malebranche explained, God arranges for the material world to undergo a parallel adjustment. There is no such thing as cause and effect; just two separate parallel worlds. According to occasionalism, these two worlds act in concert on all occasions through the agency of God. The ingenuity of the new science still had a long way to go before it could match the ingenuity of the old theology. Descartes' last notable follower was the eighteenth-century philosopher La Mettrie. He took the logical step of dismissing the mental world and insisting upon a purely mechanistic materialism, with no place for parallel universes. Or even for God, La Mettrie ended up as court philosopher to Frederick the Great, where he found it prudent to keep quiet about his atheism. But it was an over-enthusiastic demonstration of his thoroughgoing materialism that eventually led to his demise. He died after consuming a surfeit of pheasant pate, attempting to prove the mechanics of the digestive system to fellow court intellectuals. Descartes' insistence on the primacy of the individual. And the analysis of human consciousness were to prove his most lasting legacies. Both rationalism and the opposing empiricism agreed upon the need for such an emphasis, and in one form or another, this attitude continued to dominate philosophy until comparatively recently. Only with the arrival of logical analysis was the primacy of the individual and the analysis of human consciousness superseded by the primacy of the dictionary and the analysis of its contents. Once more, philosophy stands in need of a Descartes to bring it back to life. 
from Descartes' writings. It is some time since I first realized how many false opinions I accepted as true from my childhood, and how doubtful was the entire structure of thought which I had